Hi everyone, I'm John Tarilla, one of the authors of Topology, a Categorical Approach. In this video, I want to talk about two topological properties, namely Compact and Hausdorff. And while each of them separately is interesting, and there's a lot of interesting things you can say about each of them, uh, I think it's particularly fun to talk about them together because they sit somewhat in tension with one another. A space X is compact. If a space X is compact, it can't have too many open sets. On the other hand, to be Hausdorff, uh, a space must have at least so many open sets. And so a space that is both compact and Hausdorff is riding the edge. And a lot of times uh, when you're on the edge, interesting things can happen. So let me define uh, what it means for a space to be compact. So a space is compact if and only if every open cover of that space has a finite subcover. Once you know this definition, you can prove that compactness is preserved by continuous surjections. That is, the continuous image of a compact space is compact. Uh, and so in particular, compactness is preserved by homeomorphisms and is therefore a topological property. You don't have to look far for examples. I think it's helpful to start with a non-example. The real line is not compact. Uh, you can look at the cover of the real line consisting of the open intervals from minus one to one, from minus two to two, from minus three to three, and so on. And this gives you an open cover of the real line that has no finite subcover. And you can use a similar open cover of concentric open balls of increasing radii uh, to prove that every compact metric space must be bounded, which I think is interesting because bounded isn't a topological property, but compact is. Now for an example of a space that is compact, uh, the unit interval is uh, compact. And more generally, we have the heine borel theorem, which characterizes the compact subsets of Rn as exactly those subsets which are closed and bounded. So compact sets are closed and bounded, and closed and bounded subsets are compact. And one corollary of that is that uh, every continuous function on a compact set uh, to the real numbers has both a maximum and a minimum value. More generally, Closed subsets of compact spaces are themselves compact spaces. And the proof of that fact is, is straightforward. You take a closed subset of a compact space, then you take an open cover of it, you throw in the complement of the closed uh, subset, and then that gives you uh, an open cover of the entire space, which has a finite subcover, which may or may not contain the complement of your original closed set, but but the, uh, the remaining open sets in the finite subcover must cover that closed set. Now let's um, go to the other topological property. So first the definition, a space is Hausdorff if and only if every pair of points can be separated by open sets. So this means if you have two distinct points in your space, X and X prime, there's an open set U around X and U prime around X prime that don't intersect. Now, being um, a Hausdorff space is a topological property. And I think the nicest way to see that is to realize that the pre-image of a Hausdorff space under a continuous injection is Hausdorff. So if you have a, a continuous one-to-one uh, -one function from a space X to a space Y, if Y is Hausdorff, then X is Hausdorff. Um, and you can prove that by taking two points in X, uh, they map to two different points in Y, take separating open sets and pull them back. But it's also nice to compare this to the parallel statement that if you have a continuous surjection from X to Y and X is compact, then um, Y must be compact. For examples of Hausdorff spaces, um, Rn, or more generally any metric space is Hausdorff since the open balls of less than half the distance uh, of whose radius is less than half the distance between the two points will separate them. And for examples of non-Hausdorff spaces, uh, you can just look at it, the indiscrete topology on any space with two or more points. 
uh, more generally, uh, finite spaces. There are many interesting finite spaces, um, but if you're a finite space that's not discrete, then you're necessarily not Hausdorff. So now let's talk a little bit about compactness and Hausdorff together. So the first theorem is that compact subsets of Hausdorff spaces are closed. In fact, the stronger statement is true. If you have a compact subset and a point in a Hausdorff space, then you can separate the point from the compact set by uh, disjoint open subsets. And uh, an interesting consequence of that theorem is um, the theorem that functions from compact spaces to Hausdorff spaces are closed maps. And the reason is if you take a closed subset of a compact space, it will be compact. Uh, you look at its image under a continuous function, it will be compact. And as a compact subset of a Hausdorff space, it will be closed. And therefore, continuous functions from compact spaces to Hausdorff spaces send closed sets to closed sets. And therefore, if you have a continuous function from a compact space to a Hausdorff space, if it's injective, it's automatically an embedding. If it's surjective, it's automatically a quotient map. And if it's bijective, it's automatically a homeomorphism. Now, let's take a moment to try and appreciate this result. So suppose I have an injective continuous map from a topological space X to a topological space Y. Um, usually, F will not be an embedding. To say that F is an embedding is to say that uh, the space X is isomorphic, is homeomorphic to its image as a subspace of Y. Uh, to put it another way, it says that X has the subspace topology uh, induced by the map F. That's, that's an extreme topology. It's the coarsest topology on X that makes the map F continuous. And so the typical situation is that the topology on X is finer than the subspace topology. And um, in all of these cases, F fails to be an embedding, except in the extremal case that the subspace, that X has the subspace topology defined by F. Okay, and now let's consider the case that we have a surjective, a continuous surjection from a space X to a space Y. Um, now, most continuous surjections are not quotient maps. Remember, uh, a continuous surjection is a quotient map if and only if the space Y is homeomorphic to the quotient uh, of X where all of the fibers of F have been identified. That is, Y has the quotient topology defined by uh, this continuous function f, meaning that it's the finest topology uh, on y making the map f continuous. And so in the typical situation, um, the topology on y will be coarser than the quotient topology defined by f. And in that case, f will be a continuous surjection, but will fail to be a quotient map, except in that extremal case that y has the finest topology making F continuous. Okay, now let's look at that last case. Um, suppose that F is a continuous bijection between two topological spaces. Now, unlike um, many algebraic categories, morphisms that are bijections are not necessarily uh, isomorphisms. In order for F to be an isomorphism or a homeomorphism, the inverse of F must be continuous. And if you wanna think of an example, um, you don't have to be too imaginative. Uh, let X and Y be the real numbers and let F be the identity. Um, put the ordinary topology on, on Y and put the discrete topology on X. That will be a continuous bijection, but it certainly is not a homeomorphism. Now, let me continue with the comparison between the situation in topology and the situation in algebra. Um, so suppose I have a group homomorphism sigma from a group G to a group G prime. The kernel of sigma is a subgroup of G. It's a normal subgroup of G. And you can form the quotient G mod the kernel of sigma. The image of sigma is a subgroup of G prime. And these two groups are isomorphic. And this result sometimes goes by the name the first isomorphism theorem. So the immediate consequences of this result are if sigma is injective, then the kernel 
is trivial. Therefore, G is isomorphic to the image of sigma. If sigma is surjective, uh, G prime is isomorphic to the quotient G mod um, the equivalence relation that identifies the fibers of sigma. And if sigma is bijective, then G is isomorphic to G prime. So in the category of groups, every injective homomorphism is an embedding, every surjective homomorphism is a quotient map, and every bijective homomorphism is an isomorphism. In fact, you'll even find authors defining an isomorphism of groups to be a homeomorphism that is bijective. Now, um, the, what I described here for groups is true for lots of algebraic categories. We could have been working with vector spaces and linear maps. And the point is that these algebraic categories are very different than the category of topological spaces. However, in, within the category of topological spaces, if we look at the subcategory of compact Hausdorff spaces, then every injective morphism is an embedding, every surjective morphism is a quotient map, every bijective morphism is a, an, a homeomorphism. And so it, uh, the category of compact Hausdorff spaces is like an algebraic subcategory of topological spaces. Now, this turns out to be more than just an analogy. Here, uh, if you take a look at Jacob Lurie's uh, paper on ultra categories, um, he discusses the fact that the category of compact Hausdorff spaces is, is the category of algebras over a certain monad. Now, I'm not going to digress to talk about what it means to be an algebra over a monad, but the point is that you can you can see the category of compact Hausdorff spaces as an algebraic category in a very precise way. And now let me end um, with an application that, that goes back to something I said at the beginning, which is that compact and Hausdorff sit somewhat in tension with one another. So suppose I have a compact Hausdorff space, x tau, and tau prime is another topology on the same space x. If tau prime is finer than tau, meaning it has uh, more open sets than tau, then it turns out that x with the topology tau prime cannot be compact. And if tau prime is coarser than tau, if it has fewer open sets, then x with the topology tau prime cannot be Hausdorff. There, aren't, there won't be enough open sets to separate points. And now the proof of this theorem is very straightforward. If tau prime is finer than tau, then the identity map from x tau prime to x tau is continuous. And then if tau is Hausdorff and tau prime is compact, then the identity map must be a um, homeomorphism, which would be impossible if tau prime is finer. And on the other hand, if tau prime is coarser than tau, then the identity map between x tau and x tau prime will be continuous. Then if tau is compact and tau prime is Hausdorff, then the identity map must be a homeomorphism, um, which would be impossible if tau prime is, is in fact coarser than tau. And so topological spaces um, that are both compact and Hausdorff have uh, this nice balance to them. And the fact that when you look at um, the subcategory of spaces that are both compact and Hausdorff, that subcategory has uh, of topological spaces has, has nice algebraic type properties. Um, and it might lead you to, to think that we should work with only topological spaces that are compact and Hausdorff. Now, that turns out to be insufficient for, for most of our applications because we really care about non-Hausdorff spaces, quotients of, of spaces are often non-Hausdorff. We also want to work with non-compact spaces. Subspaces of compact spaces are often not, not compact. Now, there are two more general topological properties, namely that of being compactly generated and weakly Hausdorff. Uh, the category of topological spaces that are both compactly generated and weakly Hausdorff is large enough to include almost all of the spaces that we care about. And those two properties sit in a kind of tension with one another that um, conspires to make the category of 
compactly generated weekly Hausdorff spaces convenient to do a lot of topology in. So you can think of this discussion about spaces that are compact in Hausdorff as a teaser for that more involved discussion. Okay, thanks for your attention.